Welcome to Cool Spring Church. We appreciate our regular church family and our visitors always are grateful to have company. <laughs> Couple announcements. First of all, somebody's glasses case is sitting here. Your daughters? Well, how'd it get up here? <laughs> Take it home, because we'll forget. There's a lot of announcements in your bulletin. Please pay attention to those so we don't have to go over, because I know you can read. So I appreciate that. The clipboard's going around. Please make sure it keeps moving. The sign up is important because they're going to have the live nativity again at the tractor and tinsel parade in Stoneboro. And we need people to sign up for setting up, tearing down, and being live characters. It's in your bulletin if you need any more information. But we need to get that taken care of soon because when the weather changes, nobody's going to do it. So if you sign up now, well, the weather's nice. You're committed. Okay, Barb has an announcement she'd like to make. Wherever. <laughs> I just want to talk about um, the shoe boxes. Um, we do this every year and um, we pack. We will be packing on November 12th. And all year we've been collecting items. Everybody's been so generous. I asked for stuffed animals. I have twice as many, but that's great because then I have them for next year. So this congregation has always helped out a lot. And um, so every year we put a, um, a tote bag in. We have hundreds of those due to the Rosina. Um, and then we try to do hats, gloves, uh, jump ropes, a toy, yo-yos, soap, all kinds of items that kids would need, toothbrush, um, just anything that we think somebody would need, school supplies, and we do this through the year, and then on November 14th, or 12th, we're gonna be packing these, and we're gonna pack 150 of them. And they will end up uh, being sent to a distribution center in the Carolinas, and there they get inspected, and they put in uh, literature, so that uh, the kids, when they uh, open them, can read about uh, Jesus and get to know him. And it will be in their language because it goes to all uh, different countries. And the shipping for each box is $10. And um, today in our bulletins, there's envelopes that if you would wish to participate, you can write um, a check or use cash. And that will help defray the cost of getting these boxes shipped um, to the other countries. And then I'd just like to close with um, a letter from um, Frank and Graham. It said, Dear friend, there are millions of children in need around the world, many who have never received a gift. We want them to know God's gift of salvation through trusting and believing in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior and Lord. Each year we partner with churches and ministries in more than 100 countries to tell the boys and girls about Jesus through Operation Christmas Child, a project of Samaritan's Purse. Every shoebox is an opportunity to reach a child with the gospel. Thank you. Or remind me why we're only doing 150 this year. We were always excited to do as many as we possibly could. Well, last year we had trouble filling all the boxes completely full, so we cut down to see if we can totally fill every box. Mm -hmm. Because so many of them got filled the whole way, then the rest didn't get filled the whole way, so we went with less to fill every box. Okay. For this Bummer. year. Bummer. We'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I love finding out how many you can do. The first time when, when I had it 
We set up a goal of 100 boxes, and Pastor Phil said, no way are you going to get 100. And when I delivered them, they said, you have 99. And I went out, I was just so bummed, man, God, we were just trying to do 100. And here one was stuck under the seat of my car. So God, God provides for whatever number we choose, or more. So if we have more than 150, will we fill them? We got room? No, I well, unless you bring in your own shoebox. Oh, okay. I only have five. Okay. Well, Cheryl, I think we're ready for the prelude. We come to church today to worship. To worship an awesome God. Please join me in your responsive call to worship. In your bulletin and on the screen. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, O Lord, and your law is the truth. Your decrees are righteous forever, O God. Give me understanding that I may live. Let us sing our praises to the one true God. The hymn is number 562 in your hymnal or on the screen.
God in Christ forgives our sin. Amen.
With these things in mind, let us come before our God in prayer then. God, our Savior, we lift our prayers to you. We pray that they are good and that they are acceptable. Hear us now. Hear us as we come before you. For Christ dwells by your side and intercedes for us, even now, as we come before you. <clears throat> Angels' songs blend with our voices and with our thoughts, filling the air with hymns of praise that we may not be privy to. They are nonetheless true. You are clothed with all honor and majesty, and you alone are God, and we adore you. Hear us. Hear us as we pray for those to whom we we pray for we pray for those who are in authority over us. We pray for local law enforcement. We pray for our government of all levels. We pray for their health and that they would be able to withstand the pressure of public office. Hear us as we, we pray for us as citizens, especially as in another week or two we'll be exercising our right as Americans to choose our leaders. We pray, Lord, for, for peace and for the system to work as it was intended to. And may we, each one, use that gift we've been given. Help us to be responsible as citizens and to blend the diversity of opinions into a unified concern for the well-being of all. Deliver us from being suspicious of one another and help us to focus rather on the good of all. Save us. Save us from being high and mighty and lead us in the paths of service and humility. You've taught us through Christ that we can serve only one. And so we commit our allegiance to you, O God, alone. May all that we do be to your glory, so that one day, one day we would hear you say to each of us, Well done, good and faithful servant. And so, Lord, as servants, serving others, we lift up to you these joys and concerns that have been lifted up for continued healing for some, for for a new healing for others, Lord, for comfort for those that mourn, and for us to remember those who have died. And we celebrate their lives where we can. And we give you thanks, Lord, that you are also bringing comfort to others. So we lift up to you Marla and Bill, Rosina as she mourns her mother's passing. Lord, for Al, as he is coming into a difficult season, and for Janice, that you would, you would give her mind peace, you would give her rest. For Lowen, for the Crowley family, and Bernie, for Albert and Edgar, and for Betty. Lord, hear these prayers, and hear the others that may come to our minds for things that maybe we judged weren't necessary to, for everyone to hear this morning but nonetheless need our prayers. We pray, Lord, for those things that will come to us as the day progresses. And we know that we can come to you and lay everything before your feet and entrust it to you. So hear these our prayers and hear us too as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to pray through the, the offering of the gifts that God grants us, and seeking his blessing, through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
in this life. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you call us to service, to serve and care for others over ourselves. And so, Lord, out of our faith, we give unto you, and we ask your blessing on this, our offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Rosina, where did, or not Rosina, D Dolores, where did you find roses that are still around? <laughs> they look like they're like not store bought, right? No, they're not. My husband Dave gave me those 26 years ago. Aww. In memory of my dad when my dad passed away. And I've had those roses for that long, and they are so fragrant. Oh, my. They smell like clove and cinnamon. Huh. So oh, now I gotta special. check it out. They're really special roses. And somehow you protected them from the frost. Isn't that something? Oh, praise God. Get to the beauty, see the beauty in his creation all the time. It's just a wonderful thing. Well, this morning we continue in our, as we walk through this letter from the Apostle Paul to the churches in Ephesus and to us today. And so today we are reading from Ephesians 5, 5 through 21. Also 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Let us pray for illumination in the reading and the proclamation of God's word. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. We know we sin. You don't need me to preach to you that we're sinners. Most of us here, we know that. It's a no-brainer. But we also know that we are saved from our sin by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And not because of anything we've done. We, we haven't had a streak of perfection that led us to salvation in Jesus. But we know rather that we are saved by faith through grace. And we receive our assurance of pardon from all of our sin in that. Yet we, like Paul, keep doing the things that we know we shouldn't do, but we do, and, you know, and that whole roundabout that Paul talks about. But then today, he brings up a whole nother level. Willful disobedience. Willful disobedience. When we know the right, and yet we choose the wrong. Purposely sinning. Yeah, somebody said, what was it, last week or the week before, I made them uncomfortable. This ought to make us uncomfortable. The idea that we might willfully choose to disobey God. To sin on purpose. It's a fine line too between just everyday sin that we're all born into because we're human, we screw up, we, we have the wrong thoughts and stuff. But then to be faced against a choice between a right and a wrong and we choose the wrong on purpose. It's a fine line. But there's good news. And I hope that last week and the weeks prior to this, when we've, when we've been talking about Ephesians, these, the, the, the do's and the don'ts that Paul is sharing with us, I hope it doesn't leave you feel defeated. That, oh gosh, well I did that one, I guess I'm, I'm done for. No, not at all. May we find good news today in our help with this. As we confess our sins and we repent and we trust the Lord to help us so that we can overcome that we can be forgiven our willful disobedience. And the next time we're faced with it, that we have the power by the Holy Spirit to say no, to choose the right way. So in our reading today, the Apostle Paul gives a stern warning about willfully disobeying God and then follows it with the wise in the house of being obedient to God. Let's come to our reading, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord." Walk as children of light, 
for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time, because the, the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. So question to consider today. If I am a faithful Christian, if I go to church on Sundays, I believe in Jesus, but I struggle with sexual sin. If I even just say fall prey to fantasizing about a woman that's not my wife or the neighbor's wife, am I going to lose my inheritance? Will I lose my salvation? Good question. And when we read and we hear Paul's letter here to Ephesus, the churches of Ephesus, the hard answer is yes, but with a caveat, with a, with a loophole, maybe we could put it that way. Based on Paul's teaching, anything you purposely place between you and Jesus or God, anything you place more importance on than your relationship with Jesus, anything you put more time into, you spend more money on, is an idol. It's idolatrous. Therefore, it's willful sin willful disobedience if you intentionally make a conscious decision to do it. So here's the caveat. If in that struggle, if you are trying not to do it, you know you shouldn't do it, and your heart aches because you do it, you have remorse in your heart, you feel ashamed. If you're doing something that you wouldn't want your wife to know about, if you're doing something you wouldn't want the folks to be singing about in church on Sunday, and you know you shouldn't be doing it. If you feel terrible about it, you're on the right track. I think you're doing good if that's the case. Because the pagans, those who do not know Jesus, it wouldn't even occur to them to feel bad about it. So there's hope for us. If we are struggling, if we're trying not to be doing this stuff, and if we keep praying about it, we keep confessing it, God, who is faithful and just and full of mercy and love, will have mercy on your soul. And remember, in the end, God is our judge. Better be sure you are righteous before the throne of grace. And I know some of us were like, well, somebody that's like a, you know, they, a, a womanizer. Or some, somebody that's cheating on their spouse on a regular basis. You know, that I'm not saying there aren't consequences for these things in life. We're talking about eternal damnation or eternal salvation. There's hope. Because any of us who judge someone who keeps coming back and redoing that same sin over and over again, we all have struggled with something or do struggle with something that is crime. So I say this even though I know it makes us uncomfortable and maybe mad at me or at Paul or makes you search for ways to rationalize the meaning of the text. But I'll tell you, if I told you anything else, that it would mislead you and be deceiving to you. And Paul, in the text today, warns about this in verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You know, the Bible is always to be interpreted in light of what it meant to the original audience. It doesn't mean anything different to us today than to them then. The only difference might be our historical context. It will always mean the same to us as it did to them. 
So when, we, when we've heard those in our own denomination and other denominations that are struggling with all the issues of the world today, and how there are churches that seek to be like the world, to get along with everybody, and well, we just want to love everybody. It's misleading. It's deceptive. You know, Paul's teaching on homosexuality was only for them back then, they might say. That things are different today, you know, it's right up there with the head coverings and stuff, right? You know, you don't, you don't do everything the way it was back that, then. After all, if you're actively homosexual and you're a good person, God loves everyone. He'd never condemn someone for their sexual preferences or behaviors. That's just mean. God's not mean. This kind of thinking, we fall prey to it all the time, following our own understanding. Because it makes us feel good. And we don't want to be uncomfortable. Instead, we are to do as Paul tells us in the end of the reading today. In verse 21, we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So let us not look upon this as condemning us. But instead, if you are, if you are disobeying God on purpose, if you are choosing to sin, maybe by rationalizing your behavior or someone else is telling you that it's okay, it's normal, it's legal, right? Right? Or even others threaten you with, well, if you don't buy into their way of living or accept them the way they are perfectly, then you may be excluded from certain parts of your family or circles of friends or organizations. Take courage. Paul gives us four incentives as to why we might want to be obedient and push back about, against willful disobedience. Incentive number one, it, toward the end of verse six, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. God's wrath. Well, there's warm and fuzzy stuff to preach on, huh? Sounds pretty ominous. It is. It's not good. We don't want to experience God's wrath. None of us really wants God's wrath. People say all the time, ah, oh, you know, they, they're living the wildlife, they're doing their thing out there, you know, the, the people that aren't here today, okay? Out there wherever, doing their thing, partying and stuff. Last night, they partied, you know, this morning they're maybe still sleeping or they wake up with the headache and the hangover and stuff. Or the folks that, you know, folks that are deep up to their ears in porn, they spend all their money on booze and get bombed on the weekends, and they would say, so be it. Live, eat, and drink for tomorrow you die, right? And God's a good God. He's not going to condemn me for this, really. I mean, he does say he wants everyone to be in heaven with him, right? I've never heard anybody on purpose, and, and, or at least somebody that didn't deserve it, they may say. My friends, if this is one's excuse for deliberate sin, and they know God is their final judge and not us, my guess is this person does not believe in Jesus. And he will face the wrath of God with regret in the end. I hope would we, we would be of the category that loves Jesus. That tries our best. And yeah, sometimes we mess up. Some of us more than others. Some of us have had struggles we've struggled with our whole lives long. Or we suddenly realize we've been behaving badly and we work to fix it because we fear the wrath of God. Paul's not addressing those of us who struggle and know we are wrong and that we're working on it. He's speaking of those pagans, those, those who do not know Jesus, who live their whole life without consequences for their immorality. Without Jesus, Christ's forgiveness, they are doomed to being cast out of the kingdom of God. He, he goes into a little bit more detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning with verse 9, he, he, he kind of expands a little on what he's talking about in Ephesians. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and by the Spirit of our God. This is really good news. Good news for those of us that struggle. Good news. But those pagans that are living outside of a relationship with Jesus, not such good news. Time for them to get out their asbestos BVDs, I think. The takeaway for this text is that if you feel shame or if you feel guilt, you're probably doing all right. You're probably, you're, you're good. If you feel the Holy Spirit tugging you away from the sin that you're about to do, if you, if you're, you know, got the little, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other, that picture, right? And you're, you're leaning toward the devil's shoulder. But you feel the tug from the other side. There's hope. There's hope. You are not lost. Keep at it. Keep resisting. Keep leaning on the arms of Jesus and pray. Or do, do what maybe David should have done. Run the other way. Get away from the, the situations that, that lead you or pull you toward a sinful behavior. Keep at it. Keep resisting. Jesus loves you and he knows how tough it is. Remember, he lived in our skin. And you can do this with the love of Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit. So verse 7, Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Just be careful, right? Be careful if you hang out with friends who do not believe. You, you, you can work with unbelievers. You can go to school with people, the, the pagans, right? You, you can hang out. You, you can go if you're in the bowling league or whatever, and there's a bunch of sinners there. There are people that are, don't even know Jesus at all. You can do that. We're not discouraging you from that, but be careful. Don't partake in what they partake in. It's kind of like, it, it's like, the, and I know I've shared this with you before, but it's a great example. You know, when, when I was active in the motorcycle ministry and a few of us went, we were invited to the, and I don't, actually the Pagan Clubhouse, Pagan Motorcycle Club, and one of their chapters in Newcastle. They're a 1% biker club. Anyway, so we were invited to go down to their clubhouse to show respects for a gentleman who had passed away. It was, uh, the viewing was at the clubhouse. So a few of us Christian men went, and we went together on purpose, not by ourselves. And we showed respect. And we shared the love of Jesus Christ and the light of Christ within a pagan world, literally and figuratively. There was booze flowing like crazy. It was offered to us. There were women there that part of me wanted to divert my eyes. <laughs> I mean, wow. But we were able to express the love of Jesus Christ. We were able to, to be exposed ourselves, to expose the light of Christ to others who were there without judging them and without partaking in the sin that was happening there. Be careful. You can hang out with folks like this and stuff as long as you don't give in to being the, the word, the Greek word that Paul uses for partners with them literally means to not participate in their behavior. Incentive number two, in verse eight, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You're no longer to be like the pagans. You are light now. Walk as children of light. And Paul goes on to explain this down through verse 14. And, and I've always thought of the idea, I, usually when I think about how we're to shine the light of Christ, you know, in the benediction oftentimes I will, I will, I will charge you with shining, taking the light of Christ out from here into the darkness and dispel the darkness in the world. But in this text, it made, it made me realize there's another aspect of that. Yes, we're to shine, shine the light of Christ. But the light of Christ makes us transparent. The light of Christ reveals who we are. That the world can see who we are. It opens us up to being seen for the people we are. And that may be good, it may be bad. We should be living with the light of Jesus Christ in us so that others can see the life we live and desire to get some of that. Unfortunately, often the case is that when, when others see the light within us, all they do is pick on the flaws and stuff. And we do it to ourselves, we judge ourselves, and we pick out our own flaws. It's like 
It's like my, my wife has a makeup mirror next to the sink in the kitchen, or in the bathroom, you know, where she does her makeup and stuff. And every now and then something goes wrong with the thing and we got to go buy a new one because, you know, they make everything to wear out in no time at all anymore. And there's always the big debate. Does it have a bright enough light? Does it shine light everywhere? So there's no shadows. Got to have the, the regular side and then the magnification side, right? You know what I'm talking about, Mike, right? Yeah. And you probably fixed one or two, huh? Because they do, they work. <coughs> Anyways, and why do you all, ladies, why do you have one of these things so that you can see how to put your makeup on, what needs plucked? I am so glad I was not born a woman. The whole magnifying mirror thing frustrates me to begin with because it's always in the way. I'm always pushing wires and cables out of the way and stuff. And why do you wear it to, to, to see the flaws? You want the magnification so you can see what's wrong that he's fixing or whatever, right? To put that focus on yourself. Ay, ay, ay. I wonder, though, is it a metaphor for how we look at our own walk with Jesus? Do we too often focus on our walk with Jesus as trying to see what's wrong with us? And not enough to see the beauty that Christ reveals within us. Light reveals both goodness and evil. So incentive number three in why you might want to live in obedience and not willfully sin. Verses 15 to 17, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. All right, watch where you're walking, watch your steps. Look carefully at how you walk. It's a fact that, that those who regularly do the self-examination of their life, who reflect on their lives and their behavior, their outlook and speech, will improve their lives and grow in faith and in their relationship with Jesus. We do it in other parts of our life. We're always being taught, men and women both, self-examination, right? There's things you've got to be watching for. It's an early detection for cancers and stuff, right? We do it in our education. We should be doing it in our walk with Jesus. It makes sense. Paul is very specific on how we might do this. He says about walking in light, to make good use of your time. Don't waste time. We all know, right? I mean, you can never get it back. I always wonder, you know, I don't know why I thought about this in the last year or so, but you know, it's like, how much do we spend of our life going, oh, I can't wait till? Ever since we were little kids, right? Can't wait till Christmas. Can't wait till school's out. Can't wait till vacation. Can't wait to go on this big trip. Can't wait till the promotion. Can't wait till I get my raise. And the next thing you know, we get toward the end of life and we start wondering, wow, I spent most of my time waiting on stuff. Want time to pass quick? I, somebody told me recently, and I guess it's probably an old joke, an old line, but it's probably, I think it's pretty true, right? The, the closer, it's like life is like toilet paper, the closer you get to the end, the quicker it goes. I kind of think that might be true. So Paul says, don't, don't, you know, don't waste your time. Spend it wisely. And then he says to understand the will of God. Well, how, we, how do we do that? Prayer. Being in God's word. You know, spending time with the Lord, having that conversation, looking for where God's active in your life and in the world around you. Okay, instead of number four to living in obedience, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but fill, be filled with the Spirit. And I think, you know, usually when we, when we talk about this, the first thing we do is, all we do is focus on don't be getting drunk, don't be drinking too much and stuff, right? It, but it gives us an interesting comparison between two spirits. Alcoholic spirits are a depressant pharmacologically. And the Holy Spirit is a stimulant. Alcohol, as a depressant, affects the high centers of our brains, the parts that regulate control, self-control, wisdom, understanding, discrimination, judgment, and balance, and on and on. All the things that make us behave good or bad. Why do you think people, when they get drunk, will drink more? Poor judgment. Why do people drink and drive? Poor judgment, right? They make bad choices. Um, 
Be careful with alcohol. For some of us, it's best not to participate at all. Then the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a stimulate because it stimulates every part, every faculty that we possess. Our mind, our intellect, our heart, our will. Obviously, when we get drunk, we behave poorly. Well, you know, I remember years ago somebody said to me, you know, what's on a sober man's mind is on a drunk man's lips. Mm hmm Yep. Being drunk dehumanizes us. On the other hand, when we are full of the Holy Spirit, we are never more human, more alive than we are when we are full of the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are expressing our lives through fellowship with God and other believers. We worship God with others, we express our gratitude, and we submit to God's teachings as rightly read and proclaimed. It, it's really evident in our order of worship, the way we celebrate worship every Sunday. We come together in fellowship, we share a conversation. There are embraces, there is love shared with one another. We, we fellowship around a table. We have a holy meal every now and then. We worship God when we come together. Matter of fact, we do like Paul says. We sing hymns. We, we sing psalms and, and read them. We pray together. We worship every time we come together. What do we do as part of our worship? We find ways to express our gratitude through praise and giving of service. And in the end, we listen to the reading and the proclamation of God's word done faithfully and inspired by the Holy Spirit in submission to those that God has called and ordained to teach and proclaim it. Submission, meaning we are willing to respect God and those whom he's chosen to learn from. An old preacher a long time ago once said on the topic about being filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got to fill a man with something. If not the Holy Spirit, men and women will fill themselves with something. By filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit, we can then be assured we are forgiven. But don't think because you're saved that gives you license to do what you want. Just because you got Jesus does not give you license to behave badly. The pagan never even has the thought. Confess, repent, and commit yourself. And request the Holy Spirit to fill you in order to be assured of your forgiveness and spared God's wrath and judgment. Radiate the light of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit within you without, in, and without in order that all might see the light and be encouraged. And with all wisdom from the Father, receive even more power of the Holy Spirit in order to behave like those who are building this new society that Paul has been talking about, the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing together hymn number 254 and indeed cling to this cross in our walk with Jesus. Near the cross. Stand if you're able. Let us sing.
Christ Jesus by the will of God to you, the saints of the Cool Spring Church, here in Mercer. You, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, we have confessed our sins, we've given thanks, and we have heard the word of God. Go now, and do not partake in sin anymore. Live in the light, and be a witness to the light, and that you are a blessed people. Accept that blessing and use it to point others to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah.